I think we, we are ready to start the session. Um, it's a hybrid session, so I'll be talking both to the audience over here as well as the, the, the 30 people which we have on Zoom. And it's always a difficult challenge to speak to two different uh, audiences, and I think I have never done it before. So, so let's see, I'll be learning while I'm uh, playing with multiple digital instruments. So, but I first have to welcome all of you for coming. Or um, today's event, we have a lot of media here because uh, uh, um, so we have journalists from Geo, uh, Pakistan Today, um, and um, and on Zoom we are also joined by people from uh, our friends from China as well as from London. And one of the speakers, Salman Ahmed, will be dialing in from uh, London. And as you know, Salman is the CIO of Fidelity, which is the largest asset manager who which manages at around $4 trillion. And we have esteemed guests, of course, in the, in the panel today. So, so it, uh, it will be an interesting event uh, where we'll talk about a topic which is extremely important, uh, not just for us as financiers and as um, analysts and investors, but also as Pakistanis and people who live here. And of course, you know, we've just gone through a massive nat uh, natural disaster. So this is an issue which uh, is um, well understood now. And we have been forced, unfortunately, we have been forced to learn about the significance of this issue uh, in a way which perhaps is not the most fortunate one. Uh, but in a way, the, 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 the brightest idea is that now, um, I suppose the relevance of this topic for Pakistan is the top is a top of the agenda thing for our government, our policy makers. And eventually, I think investors will also start realizing um, how um, and, and thinking about how climate change and the impact of that um, should be incorporated in our portfolio making process. So let me share my screen for the guys on Zoom agenda of today will be that first I'll run through this presentation, which has been produced by my colleagues in the research team of KK. And it's a very comprehensive presentation, which uh, I think is a seminal work. Um, certainly hasn't been done in the capital markets, because not only have they gone through on a, a survey of how, uh, what is the current situation with climate change in Pakistan, but it also addresses and um, has uh, covered the way forward, especially with the re collaboration with China. So the reason, so we were slightly rushed in doing this event because of two reasons. Uh, so we were almost forced to do it earlier because of course COP 27 starts next week um, in, in um, Egypt, uh, Sharon al Sheikh, but also the prime minister's visit to China, which is already there. And uh, so we thought that it would be timely to publish this to bring this work, which the team of K-Trade has done, um, um, bring it for, uh, to the policymakers so that they can use it ahead of COP27. And hence, I thought it was very important for the media colleagues which we have here to, to uh, disseminate this to the audience uh, so that it can be used by Pakistan ahead of these important meetings. And I'm really honored by the, the guests we have over here who are the real experts in this area. And, um, and we were talking in the report that one of the biggest challenges with addressing climate change and this issue is knowledge. Because uh, suddenly this topic has become forefront, but we lack information. Both us as investors, uh, Pakistan as a country, policymakers as, as an audience, and everybody, and corporate citizens, everybody lacks information on three, three fronts. We lack information on why is it important, we lack information on how will it impact us, and we lack information on how can we exploit the opportunities and prepare for it. So, so almost it's it's a it's a it's a uh, uh, interesting combination that uh, there's limited information, not just on the problem but also how to solve it. Um, and there are very few times when such things happen that uh, not only do, you don't know what the problem is, and so so certainly it becomes difficult on how to uh, solve for it. This report covers a lot of these issues. So I'm quite proud of the work of my colleagues uh, who have published it and, um, and I'll have the burden of presenting their work. It's always more challenging to, 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 to present other people's work uh, because uh, uh, I don't want to take the credit of 
the high quality work which they have published, but we will share with you some of copies of the report after the presentation and I'll email it to the people who are in the audience. I think the key, the key important thing, um, we, we all understand how climate change, how climate is in, uh, temperatures are increasing. But the most important thing, which I thought the, the team had found was that over the last 70 years, so since Pakistan was formed, our temperature has gone up by 2.5 degrees. Now 2.5 degrees is a, is a big number. It's a big number because of multiple reasons, because it's a big number. Of course, we, we are in a uh, hot zone. Um, so it affects us in terms of our usage of um, electricity, our consumption of electricity. Uh, it affects our health. It affects the kind of disease which are produced. But there are other important reasons as well, which are, although the 2.5 number a prima facie I might look like a small thing, but actually it changes our whole, it requires changes in our whole lifestyle because of two reasons. First, it affects the melting of glaciers. It affects the rainfall, which means that it affects the availability and uh, the nature of the water which is available. But secondly, it changes health. Um, uh, it has effect on our health because the diseases which are created from it are also very different. And lastly, it affects agriculture, which, which is the topic which we will discuss in detail today, but from, especially I'll, I'll get the view from the experts which we have, because if it affects agriculture, it affects the yields, then that means that we will have to change the way we live. We will have to change the kind of things we eat. We will have to change the kind of products we grow. So it requires changes, not just in our investment portfolio, but it requires changes in the crop which we are growing, uh, how we are growing that crop, what are we eating, what are we wearing. And so it requires fundamental changes in the supply chain. And of course, this is a global uh, issue. And globally, annually, the temperatures are increasing by 0 0.65 degrees um, uh, per annum, which again is an is a alarming level of growth. Now, of course, the, the floods which we saw in Pakistan, because it's timely, so I think a lot of us now have more information about this than people in the in globally, but climate is becoming erratic. And uh, just in 2021, we saw multiple um, anomalies around the world. So, of course, you know, some, of the, some of the things which caught, which were highlights in the news were the, the fires in Australia, the floods in the US, the hurricanes in, in Europe, um, in London, you know, people were really struggling when, you know, the, when, when the extreme heat. And uh, it's, it's a very profound issue, especially if you combine it with the fact that we have an energy problem as well in Europe. So you have an energy problem, which means you cannot put ACs on in, in, in summers. Mm -hmm. And energy costs have gone up by 70%. So even if you have air conditioning, even if you have fans, you can't afford to put them on. But then you're dealing with extreme temperatures. So it has become a serious natural disaster, but also a serious health care issue. So Europe, as you all know, has an aging population. So with, with the aging population, with burdened NHS, burdened healthcare system, climate change of 0.68 degrees per annum is a very significant issue and perhaps the most significant change which we are dealing with right now. Um, I, I, I'll not go, uh, I'll run through this presentation a bit quickly because I want to focus on the point about, about uh, collaboration in China. Um, but as you know that under COP26, we have made commitments and the world, the global, the global society and global leaders have made a commitment in terms of how will we slow down and bring down the space uh, of increase both in temperature as well as in carbon emission. So, you know, I think again, this curve, this chart is quite interesting. Um, it shows how the temperatures are just increasing. The whole curve is moving up. Shoot. Oh, no problem at all. 
it, it is a media event, so I do want it to be captured by you guys. From, for me, the biggest thing which comes across from this work, from this slide, is that, of course, the temperature is increasing, rising, but also the pattern of temperature is changing. So the monsoons are not in the time which we expected to happen. Um, so what does it mean for, for, for us? Does it mean that we change the summer holiday pattern? Does it mean that... Um, we, do we change our agricultural sowing patterns because you know the, the rainfall will happen in a different time period. Uh, the weather peaking will be in a different time period. Does it mean that we change the type of crop which we are growing? Because maybe with, with the changing temperatures, uh, all of that also has to be changed. So I'll ask those questions to the audience when we go into that area. So you know, this, this shows um, a classification. And in, interestingly, most of the because most of the population lives near the Indus and that there's a higher concentration towards the south. So actually we all we live in the hottest areas globally. Now, an interesting thing to tie in with that slide which we saw previously was that Fidelity did this study and the overlap climate data with investment data, and that showed that any, any zone, which is in that, if I go back to that red slide, any, any country which is in that red zone, within 50 years, all of those areas will be wiped out economically, which means that there will not be any, there won't be any, um, agricultural output which can come from there. And these areas will fair, face water shortage. And that means that if you are managing pension money, if you are a long-term investor, as you know that in Europe, most of the asset under management comes from the insurance sector and the pension sector. Now, these investors, because they, are, they have to plan for 100 years or 70 years, 50 years, because they have to match their assets and liabilities with actuarial projections of lifetime. So we are looking at 60, 70, 80 years lifetime, which means you're making 80 years investment decisions. And in that, you cannot invest in a region which will not be investable, which will not be there in 10, 80 years back. So it's, it's a very, very stark and very, very challenging um, observation. So this is what I was telling earlier, that globally, Temperatures are rising by 0 0.68 degrees per annum. In Pakistan, over 70 years, our temperature has increased by 2.5 degrees. And it's a consistent rise. It has been rising. And the pace, you, know, you see that spike up in 2001. So it's even, even more alarming. So how, how does it impact us? It impacts us, as, as we spoke earlier, it impacts us in terms of the availability of water, it impacts us on the quality of water, and it impacts us on the timing of when that water is available. So three fundamental changes, not just that um, uh, water availability will be an issue, but also predicting when the water will be available and what quality of water will be available is uh, uh, is quite important because their climate might lead to changes in the monsoon rainfall patterns. And my colleagues also found that it will affect, when we talk about water quality, that it will affect what kind of crop can come out of that water and what kind of sea um, uh, marine can survive in that water. Again, that's, that was quite profound for me because I thought that, okay, we all know that there are floods, but what we know is that the water quality also has an impact on what can grow in that water. So according to their work, this temperature rise leads to an 8 to 10% loss in yield. Again, a very significant amount. If you think about that number, 8 to 10%, we are already a country which is facing food shortage. Our population is already growing. We are all, 
at the same time, we are importing food and food availability globally is becoming a shortage. Right now we are facing that in terms of the Russian-Ukraine war. But besides that, there's a 10% loss of yield. So, so this is even more scary because A, the gap is increasing and B, instead of improving yields, this issue is causing a 10% decline in our yield. It also leads to a 48% is a drought, which if, if there are droughts, then that lead to a 48% reduction in life, livestock output. So both agriculture as well as um, livestock get affected by it. As we discussed earlier, it has an impact. And more colleagues are joining us. Uh, we might have some chairs over there and some chairs here. For me, for me, this uh, the scary thing about you know this slide was that our temperature rise is significantly higher than the global average. So we are facing this issue more. One of the reasons for that is our geography. Um, China on one side, India on the other side. Both are industrializing. Both are growing, and both are contributing. So even if even so, we are one of the sufferers from. Uh, climate change. Um, I'm glad that the, glo the global community is now recognizing that. So uh, in COP27, we have been highlighted as a sufferer from climate change. Uh, but it, as we discussed earlier, it changes electric demand patterns. So your usage of air cooling changes, the pattern changes. Uh, so that is implication for you know, companies producing electric white good products. And it also has implication for energy production. So three kinds of main issues, which the challenges which you face, a floods, we know that already, a lot has been talked about it, I won't go over it. Now, we did produce this report before the floods, so, 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 so you know, perhaps uh, credit to the team for it earlier, but two other things which haven't hit us yet in terms of the, the uh, becoming big in public perception is heat waves and droughts. And uh, we need to be prepared for that because um, they are serious issues. So as my colleagues uh, quoted, according to a recent study, Pakistan is 100 times more likely to experience record-breaking heat waves um, going forward. So the first issue we just spoke about is floods. Again, I don't want to go over it in detail uh, just because I know uh, it's being talked about a lot. But what I wanted to highlight was that it has a human cost and it has an economic cost and it's going to reoccur. So you know, we might get some support for one year, but it's something which will reoccur. So it's not, it's not a, one-off event, so which means that we need to be prepared for the reoccurrence of it. We all know this in terms of how the monsoon floods affected us in terms of the loss. I think the government estimated the impact to be around $30 billion uh, in total, and those numbers are changing. Uh, but whether it's 30 or 14 or 15, I think that's what is real is that it's, it ha, it's, it's a big impact and it's a big human impact and it's a big economic impact. Now, the, 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 if we realize that there's a big economic impact uh, and it requires fundamental changes uh, in, in everything, it, uh, in what we wear, what we eat, uh, how we eat and how we travel and what the, the, how we use electricity, then it asks it ask the next question that what's happening globally in terms of dealing with it. So important, we all know that the, the most fundamental agreement in this area was the Paris Agreement, in which the global community committed to spend around $200 billion, which would come from the developed countries and which will go to the developing countries. Now, unfortunately, so every year there's a meeting for that, the Paris last the US regime 
uh, pulled out of the Paris Agreement um, as President Trump famously, um, quite vocally, didn't believe in the data on climate change. He didn't believe, he doesn't generally believe in science. Uh, but luckily, uh, uh, good uh, for humanity that the, the, his predecessor, the person who uh, uh, replaced him, does believe in that, and the US is back in the Paris Agreement. Uh, but one, one worrying sign is that instead of going and delivering on the commitment on the agreement which was signed, which is which mandates 200 billion to be spent on it, we haven't really achieved that target. And instead of that, in every COP, COP meeting, every annual meeting, they come up with a new target. Um, it would have been much better if they just tried to deliver on the earlier target rather than coming up with new targets every year. So the report has data on um, greenhouse gases. I won't go into detail on that, but I'll, sh um, I'll, I'll it, it will be in the report so you can read, read it. And those who are in the audience um, can also download the report once you share. Um, I think this was very important that uh, COVID forced us to retrench and that led decline in greenhouse gases and carbon emission. And we saw how nature came back in that area globally. And there were pictures, I'm sure you would have seen that. Um, green, greenery came back in cities. Uh, we started seeing further um, uh, visibility increase because pollution settled. But most importantly, birds came back as well. So suddenly when humans were restricted because forced to restrict their activity for a time period, we saw that the nature was starting to fight back. So that's, that's a, a ray of hope that nature has a way of solving uh, this problem. But post COVID, the biggest increase, we saw a big increase in greenhouse uh, and carbon emission. And the biggest increase came from India in our neighborhood. And this is not a political comment, but um, India, EU, and US were, saw the largest increase in carbon emission um, post COVID. And scarily, I think this will, at least in India, this will continue just because of the growth. Um, Chinese emission, China is one of the biggest emitter um, of carbon, but Chinese emission has been low uh, also because uh, this is a big area of focus for China and also because they have still have COVID. So, um, um, this is something which is alarming. So what should we ask for when, when, when we are going to COP27 and when our leaders talk to global leaders and the global community, what should be our ask? And the four, the four things, if you look at the points which my colleagues have discussed, they're asking for more responsibility, they're asking for the developed countries to adhere to the commitments which they have made, but they're also asking for technical and financial support. And they're also talking about changes in the global supply chain. But essentially, there are four things. Of course, those are the details. If I simply, there are just four things. We need more money to solve the problem. We need policy for solving the problem. The second thing, we need, the third thing is we need education, knowledge. And that's what you know. this panel is to tell us as well. But we need to know and we need to have the knowledge of how to use technology and how to use other tools to change and deal with climate change. So knowledge is really important. And I was tell, telling uh, the audience the, the, uh, initially, I, I started off by saying that technical support is really important. And lastly, we need to change the supply chains. So you, you really need global collaboration and uh, it cannot be Unfortunately, over the last few years, four or five years, there has been a trend of looking, looking inwards. And this has been led by the US, but we are seeing that in other countries as well, that instead of collaborating globally, they are looking inwards and put, making barriers and walls. Unfortunately, climate is a global problem and it requires global collaboration and it requires knowledge transfer. So from Pakistan, prevention, uh, as we discussed earlier, the issues were drought, heat waves, and floods. So dealing with drought requires setting up monitoring centers to 
um, track this and give early warnings. Um, the National Drought Monitoring Center has installed gauge, rain gauges at the district level. So I think um, this is uh, really important. Um, so not only should we do, so we need preventing measures against the floods. Um, the Met Office has also set this up. This requires further, uh, the data for that should be shared. So you, you need to be looking out for floods, looking out for droughts and measuring it at district level. You need the uh, strengthening of the electric vehicle policy. Um, there has been some uncertainty about it. Uh, the targets which were set was that 30% of new cars should be electric by 2030 and 90% by 2040. These are very aggressive targets, but we require consistency. As we said, this is a really important area, so there should not be uncertainty around it. And now moving to um, the cause of Prime Minister is China has, the one thing which China is really good at, as we all know, is making 10 year, five year, 10 year plans and then delivering on it. So because China has done a lot of policy thinking on it, there's a body of knowledge which is available over there, which we can use to ad and adopt. One of the things which they want to do, so we all talk about the Belt and Road Corridor, is that they want to launch a green corridor, which will be focused on three things agriculture and um, environment, food security, and green development. So I think Pakistan should also seek to see how can we become a part of that and utilize the knowledge. Um, the report covers what has China done in terms of its clean energy focus. And this slide is really important that as I told you earlier that we need four things. We need money, we need policy, we need knowledge. And then we need to change the supply chain. China is doing all of those four things. So it's investing in money, it's um, in climate, climate change, it's developing new technology, it's making the right policies, and it's making sure that those policies are being implemented. Um, some of you might know that I was a technology analyst in Europe. So one of the sectors which I used to cover um, was solar. Uh, solar cells manufacturing. And the interesting thing was that when China made the policy, they were focused on the complete value chain. It's not that they just said, okay, we don't need solar cells and let's put up solar plants over here. I saw gov some government official commenting, uh, the former finance minister, we, I was in an event and he said, oh, Pakistan, I, I encourage industrialists to put solar cells and solar manufacturing plants. It's not that trivial. What China did was, there's a German company which is called Extron, and then there's a US company called Vico, which they are duopoly. They have the technology for making the machines which make the compound which is used in solar. So they even went and they gave incentives for these companies to come and set up plants so that the wafer can be produced domestically. And they gave massive subsidies to their local companies, and then they ended up acquiring the German company Extron um, and bring that technology. So you really have to study the complete value chain because if there's anything missing in that, you won't be able to uh, deliver on, on this. Now, China has done it. Uh, I, now, there are two ways of going about it. One way is which now, unfortunately, which we are the trend, the worrying trend which we are seeing is that US is putting sanctions on technology transfers in certain areas, including semiconductors. Now, that's really worrying because if you put a barrier on any place in the value chain, that will stop the complete um, technology, the, the whole thing from moving. You won't even, you, so you might make a policy of making EVs in your country, but if you don't have semiconductors, or if you don't have the machines that make semiconductors, you won't be able to get uh, to the end goal. So we really need global collaboration, and I don't think there's any room for politics on this, just because the stakes are so high. They're not just economic stakes, the, they're also human stakes, and um, the outcomes can be catastrophic. Of course, energy mix is a very important area. A lot of countries talk about it in terms of putting the tariffs, in terms of how much should be uh, carbon uh, fossil fuels in the energy I, unfortunately, I think countries like Pakistan, because we are developing countries, they really don't have that much ability to force this change unnaturally, just because of the cost, just because of our economics. But as you will know that even Saudi Aramco has given targets to be carbon neutral. So, so the change is possible. 
um, but um, I think it has to be led by the developed countries. So another thing which China did was force their country companies to move to lower carbon, uh, installing greater solar. And this is really important, and I will come to this to the expert when we uh, because we have a, a, a real expert on this topic, which is established carbon markets. So um, it's a big area for 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 China, and it's an area which is developing for us as investors. This is really important because. This would be something new which will be traded and asset allocation towards carbon credits and for tradable carbon market is becoming a big market and it's important that pakistan participates in in that pakistan already has some areas like collaboration both at various levels with universities with technology companies uh, across these four areas which is agriculture energy and green initiatives so strengthening that um, would be extremely important And the report discusses that, as I said, I will share the report with you. In which I will share the details of Pakistan, which are the agreements that are in China, which we can work on, and which we should build. But for us, it is a good thing that China has done a lot of work, has made a lot of policy, has made a lot of investment, has created a lot of money. क्रिएट की है दुनिया भर से टेक्नोलॉजी को अपने पास लाके इंक्यूबेट किया है और अब वो स्टेज पे हैं जिस स्टेज पे वो टेक्नोलॉजी पाकिस्तान को ट्रांसफर हो सकती है और जिससे हमें फायदा होगा तो दैट्स द एंड ऑफ द प्रेजेंटेशन एज सेड इट्स अ वेरी वेरी डिटेल प्रेजेंटेशन एंड आई डोंट वांट टू गो टू द इन टर्म्स ऑफ द ग्रोइंग द ग्रेनुलरिटीज एंड आल्सो बिकॉज़ आई वांट टू गो टू द पैनल सो आई विल हैंड द माइक टू द पैनलिस्ट एंड आई आई जस्ट आस्क द क्वेश्चन द फॉर्मेट वुड बी that i'll kick off with some moderated questions um, based on the topics which we discussed in the report and then we'll open it up to you to have an interactive conversation first thing which i want to talk uh, ask you but before that would be great uh, if we can have a brief introduction but then i have a list of questions to ask you so perhaps uh, we can start with you uh, with your uh, dr sayed mahmood nasir uh, i am uh, advising also anglo uh, for foundation for their uh, carbon offsetting uh, project and also associated with nasir uh, shabgari sahab in various uh, disciplines and i'm also uh, visiting faculty on uh, uh, climate change and uh, biodiversity and anthropology in patna women university rawalpindi uh so it's very nice to be here uh before uh, we talk i must congratulate you for uh, preparing being from the financial sector and preparing a climate change presentation that's commendable thank you ji uh, assalam alaikum uh, this is ahmed shayan and i am the sustainability lead at anglo foundation so we are working on different initiatives uh with making engro a more uh, carbon and neutral organization so uh, we'll be sharing some of those initiatives with the audience thank you thank you that's it i shall carry my second life after the financial sector i am now committed to plantations and uh, especially that i have a vision to plant one billion trees in pakistan and uh, this has uh, a lot of uh, ideas and uh, things which have been brought up by many people pakistan had seen uh, million billion tree tsunami uh, program earlier and uh, will also give some thoughts about uh, what has gone right and what has gone wrong and where do we stand and what we should do in terms of uh, plantations and the farming uh, patterns which are now going to be uh, affected uh, severely Uh, but there is always a hope, and the hope is what which keeps us uh, moving and driving. And I am one of those persons who believes in that hope. So thanks a lot. Uh, that's here from our panelists uh, also, uh, especially on the climate change. Is there uh, the Sanjay uh, Kumar is uh, I would say a catalyst in the uh, areas of uh, carbon uh, credits happening in the country. So, first we can hear from him. 
Thank you. But and just before that, I will uh, uh, because I have to mention that we published a report uh, a couple of years ago on ESG screening of Pakistani companies. And uh, the impact of our, the purpose of our report was to highlight which companies in Pakistan, the listed ones, are focused on thinking about doing the right practices and doing good both for all the stakeholders, not just for their shareholders. And Engro came on the top of that list. And so I'm really delighted. I know this was two years ago. So I'm really, I'm not surprised and delighted that you know, we have part from Engro Corporation and South Hercules uh, in the audience. Uh, and so this is a consistent thing which we are fighting across the board. So we'd love to also hear, I look forward to hearing from you about what Andrew is doing in this. And first, Professor, I would love to hear from you about uh, this topic. Uh, there is little room left for me after this uh, in-depth uh, presentation, but I'll give you my perspective on uh, this game, uh, which is going on on uh, carbon credits and uh, climate change. Uh, before starting, would you like to introduce uh, the uh, focus participants? Uh, because we have a lot of people on Zoom so, as well. Who are, uh, so, uh, I'll give you a, a, a different perspective of what's going on. Now, the climate change uh, story is, uh, uh, let's have a 1992 as the benchmark, when it was uh, realized that it's real, it's happening. And the uh, culprit was, main culprit was carbon and uh, emissions globally. And uh, at that time, it was 300, 278 to 300 uh, parts per million. Uh, that increased uh, uh, parts per million from the pre-industrial era. Uh, and the aim was by the year 2000, let's have it uh, not more than 350. Uh, and and every uh, industrial country would reduce 5% of its uh, carbon emissions by 2005 uh, from the 1992 level. And everybody in the world agreed, and it was so good in Rio de Janeiro, and uh, things were very fine. But the world does that is not static. This present world it kept on changing, and. Uh, uh, China and India and Brazil were in the non annex countries, which was a list of uh, uh, countries who were not having regulatory framework to reduce their carbon emissions. Uh, but in 2002, it was uh, 1997, it was realized by the uh, West that, oh my God, if we keep on investing on reducing our carbon footprints uh, and uh, investing heavily, uh, Indians and Chinese are catching up. And they did it. Uh, so as of now, uh, the emissions of China as a whole are more uh, than those of the United States. Uh, so what can be done? And Indian, uh, Indians, as you know, have become an industrial, uh, one of the uh, top 10 or 5 industrial countries. Uh, top, they are in G20. Uh, so what can be done? So there were two pathways. Uh, in uh, One was the clean development mechanism. Uh, of the Kyoto Protocol, one of the three was the, for us, which is uh, relevant to us, is the Green Development Mechanism of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, everything was fine. Uh, billions of dollars were transacted to uh, quantify carbon emissions into certificates and uh, by law force the corporations to purchase and offset their uh, emissions. But then came uh, Mr. Trump is uh, very recent. Then came, uh, who was that? Uh, Ford, President Ford, uh, turn on President Bush, President Bush uh, in the, and he just uh, quit the Kyoto Protocol and thinks the rate of carbon credit in the carbon market at that time was as high, going as high as $30 or $250. It suddenly came down to cents uh, just a few years back. Uh, so, uh, the, the way was found out in the Paris Agreement uh, that uh, uh, Article 6, I would ask the youngsters to focus on Article 6, 6.2, 6.4 of the Paris Agreement. And a way was found out that let's uh, promote the voluntary carbon markets and uh, let's uh, go back. And there was, uh, uh, first was the INDCs intended 
nationally determined commitments of each country of the 192 countries of the world. Uh, Pakistan also did it, China also did it, and uh, it was voluntary uh, commitment. Uh, as compared to, to the CDM of the Kyoto Protocol, so this is the Kyoto Protocol, which was regulatory, uh, binding, legally binding. So, uh, but the uh, bad part of the story is if you calculate the carbon emission reduction commitments of the entire countries of the world, you are still heading towards 500 parts per million. And 500 parts per million by the year 2050 or 2070. That means uh, things are unusual. That is what brings the capital markets and the financial institutions into it. Uh, because uh, as the insurance sector or uh, every industry would have the insurance sector, uh, the risks were fire, theft, or um, earthquake, but there was never a risk of uh, climate change. So that brings the uh, the, uh, the, cop the corporations, the businesses, the financial sector into it. And uh, a good deal has been done by 4CI and IATA in, in International Energy Trading Agency and uh, International Civil Aviation Authority in uh, Montreal. They have done a lot. Uh, but, uh, and the transactions on the warranty carbon market as of now, Last year, they were exceeding $2 billion. Uh, the things for us uh, to look into is that uh, we don't have a regulatory framework to work with. So if Anglo is interested in investing, what, what are the rules, what are the laws, what are the policies uh, to invest into it? Uh, and do the government uh, ministries have the capacity to make those policies, make those legislation? Uh, we don't know. Uh, just to update you that uh, uh, as of now, the, what was uh, done in the Kyoto under the Kyoto Protocol was uh, the, uh, billions of dollars invested and uh, transacted for uh, carbon credits. Uh, that was on hold. Uh, in the Paris Agreement, it was termed as IT, uh, converted into ITMOs, internationally trans transmitted mitigation options. And there are so many rules, and there is the Paris rule book, which uh, has them all. For us, what matters for the Pakistani corporate sector is uh, whether we go to the voluntary carbon market or we go for the regulatory market. Uh, who has the answer? Uh, we have to work hard to find the answer. What at, uh, the global map you have shown in the investments coming here, uh, European Union have their own ETS, European uh, Trading uh, System, uh, Carbon Trading System. The US, as you have mentioned in the report, they have cap and trade. The Chinese have developed their uh, carbon ex exchange. The Indian Minister for Environment last month announced that, uh, that the Indian government puts a ban on export of carbon credits from India. Uh, just if you do a few days back, Indonesian government has stopped uh, you know, voluntary carbon market validators like Vera to validate their carbon offsets from forests. Uh, what is happening there? Uh, are we uh, ready for that? So this is the question we should be asking and, uh, you know, collectively with uh, financial experts that uh, and right people, which I see like Ali and uh, especially Nasir Shahza, we find these answers. Uh, uh, and if the government is not uh, serious, let us develop our own voluntary carbon market, which uh, the caveat is that in case there is a uh, regulatory market under the international treaty, uh, Pakistani businesses should not suffer. Uh, the rates uh, being offered these days to uh, Pakistani offset or carbon uh, credits is 10 to $15. If you check the European Union uh, ETS system, there the, the minimum rate is 80 euros uh, as a, and as high as 150 euros. So I can uh, give those references uh, and ask uh, your research team to keep on working on it. In, uh, and we have to develop our own standard uh, of, uh, in, uh, for the Pakistani voluntary carbon market.
because many uh, foreign companies are now approaching uh, uh, with the uh, government entities to uh, buy of 60 years, next 60 years of credits from the forest that uh, in uh, of Pakistan. Uh, what does that 60 years mean? Uh, by the year 2017, what will be the rate of this carbon credit? It's the financial institution, the, uh, the beautiful minds, like uh, we have here the CEOs of the uh, corporations to look into it. Uh, and uh, uh, in case there is a regulatory market after this COP27 uh, of Sharam uh, there uh, if there is a regulatory market, and at that time, if all our potential carbon credit sources of sinks are already sold out to uh, foreign companies at peanuts or at shoestrings, uh, that was uh, that has something to uh, uh, take care. And by the way, uh, Gita Trinbag, the young girl from Sweden, she has boycotted Sharon Sheikh COP27. She says it's all greenwashing uh, because uh, what they are saying is they are not doing it. But we have to be very sensitive to that because we are the country, we are affected by the negative effects of climate change. And we can't keep on uh, taking a ball to the donors and crying. But uh, since last 22 years, I am watching uh, negotiations or compensation for climate change to poor countries. But uh, the promises are made and then U turns are taken. Let's work on our own. Thank you for that. Very nice and very important. We certainly need uh, clarity in framework and work on it because otherwise we lose the opportunity. There are a few comments I see on the chat, and people are highlighting that perhaps we should now focus on South South partnership. And somebody has mentioned that it's important for Pakistan to consider how to link finance to so funds such as adaptations, adaptation fund, black green climate fund and other global funds which are available. So that's a question which I'll ask later. But before that, Shayan, would love to hear from you, what is Enduro doing and um, how do corporates like Enduro, how are you seeing the opportunity? Uh, thank you so much, Ali. Uh, first of all, I would like to really commend uh, the report you guys shared. I think it was really well researched and I think it's something that we need to communicate a lot more to audiences at large, the public, Corporate sector policymakers, all of us, because I think, as you mentioned, the the knowledge gap is very significant at the moment, and that would be the first step to taking any action that has like consequences for us in the future. Uh, so, uh, as far as uh, businesses in Pakistan are concerned, and I'll obviously only speak on behalf of uh, Corporation and I'm part of Angry Foundation, which is a CSR and sustainability wing of the organization. So I can share some uh, insights from our perspective. Um, I think to contextualize a bit of the challenge for us, uh, Pakistan as a country contributes less than 1% to global greenhouse gas emissions, but we are the fifth most vulnerable country to climate change. So we need to understand that we are a recipient of uh, consequences and uh, pollution from or, or carbon emissions from other parts of the world, but we cannot, we don't have the limits to not take ownership of that and not to treat it as an emergency because we are disproportionately affected by it. So in light of that, I think balancing and for policymakers and people uh, everywhere in the country, the real argument is balancing your economic growth with uh, climate resilience and adapting to climate change. So in that sense, uh, there are multiple initiatives that have been taken uh, by Anglo Corporation. Uh, as you all may know, and uh, I'll just give a brief introduction, we are a conglomerate. Uh, we are based in Pakistan. We have businesses in energy production, fertilizers, petrochemicals, um, and uh, manufacturing, rice manufacturing and export. So we are very in, in uh, trans uh, communication infrastructure also uh, recently. So we are a diversified group and our footprint is from all the way from Karachi, all the way to the north of the country. So um, our, our geography is very spread out to, uh, throughout the country. Our teams, people, communities live throughout the country. So we are a very uh, 
Pakistani organization. We have 100% stake uh, in the growth of Pakistan and the well-being of Pakistan. And we understand that we cannot just wrap up and go to another country because we are not like a multinational with limited stakes in the country. So I think the, the central idea of our strategy in our business is to keep solving the most pressing issues of Pakistan and to do uh, good in a way that is beneficial for the economy, for the bottom line and for the country at large. Uh, so in that sense, um, multiple initiatives are being taken at the moment. Uh, we have been working for more than two to three years now to shift towards sustainability. And uh, we have been able to finalize a lot of the uh, initiatives and a lot more are in the pipeline also. So firstly, at the end of foundation, what we're doing is we are focus focusing on three different areas. The first is uh, reducing our carbon emissions and uh, offsetting our carbon footprint. So for that, uh, we partnered with, uh, and Mr. Uh, Sabin is giving us technical uh, advice and consultancy on the program. Uh, we partnered with WWF Pakistan and the Ministry of Climate Change to plant and protect 50,000 acres of forests over the next 10 years. And that is a group wide initiative that we've taken um, because we understand that as a business that is mostly a manufacturing uh, unit, there will be, after our reductions and after our uh, you know, shift to renewables, there will always be a small portion left that will not be you know, mitigated. So that is one way to kind of. Um, offset our, our, our footprint. So that is, so we've had like research done on our businesses, okay, this much percentage, we have to switch to renewables, let's say. We have to use less water on, on, on these operations. So this chunk, this has to happen for the business to continue, and that will be offsetting through different uh, agreements with, with the provinces uh, and, and different communities in the country to kind of help sustain increased forest cover in the country that gives resilience to the communities over there, resilience to flooding, resilience to heat waves, but it also uh, is adding to the forest cover, proving additionality to the overall forest cover, and through that we will be uh, claiming uh, offsets for that. Uh, another initiative that we are working on, and you talked about how China focuses on the value chain. So one of our uh, businesses, Engro Polymer, is working on circular economy for plastics. And how and, and over there, our focus area is to um, address the challenges of plastic waste in Pakistan. And they are multifold uh, from uh, informal uh, waste management to not, uh, you know, coherent policies across the country to mismanagement and leakages into the system. So we have two, three different initiatives under our Anglo Circular Plastics program. Uh, one of the first things we did was to address the knowledge gap. As you mentioned, we set up a research institute in partnership with the Karachi School of Business and Leadership. And over there, uh, it's called the Circular Plastics Institute. And what we are doing over there is to carry out on-ground methodological research and connect stakeholders from the government, from the provinces, from municipal authorities, from academia, from corporates, and bring them together on a platform where everybody who has a stake in plastics and waste management can come together and we can bridge that knowledge gap. Uh, another thing that we are uh, working on right now is uh, having a pilot of a waste management unit uh, in Baraka with Manobar. And our partner for that is Abdul Hamid Khan Memorial Trust. They're like, they have a very good record of 20 plus years of managing waste uh, in different parts of the country. So what we are trying to do is we're trying to set up a model that we feel on paper that works. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to demonstrate that it works uh, in practicality also. Uh, so we partnered with the government stakeholders over there. We partnered with the NGO and we're trying to show that a proper waste management pilot unit can work and can be sustainable in the long term. Uh, and then the other thing that we're doing within this ambit is trying to scale up the impact of plastic recyclers, plastic entrepreneurs in the country. So we have certain funds that have been allocated to work with smaller plastic recycling uh, players, helping them formalize, helping them reach to customers that will scale up their impact. So that is the third thing that we're doing on that. Then another uh, uh, thematic area that we have identified is 
the loss of biodiversity in Pakistan. So there is a huge uh, loss uh, all over the world. So hundreds of species have gone extinct over the last 20 years. And one uh, species that is super crucial to Pakistan is the Indus River dolphin. These are blind dolphins. Uh, they have been in Indus River for millions of years. They were here when there used to be a death at sea before the Indian subcontinent in Asia and you know the sea dried up. Uh, they've been in, in this uh, geography for, for millennia and millions of years actually. And they are highly endangered at the moment because on the Indus River, they're freshwater dolphins, so they do not go into the sea. So from the Himalayas all the way to you know the uh, de Delta, they initially had, uh, they would migrate, they would be thriving, and then we started building garages and water infrastructure that segmented the population. Then obviously the, the human population grew, fishing practices became a lot more unsustainable. So all these changes, man-made man changes, resulted in that species being uh, becoming endangered. And in this river dolphins, like the apex species of the river, it means they are the at the top of the food chain. And if you have a thriving Indus River dolphin uh, population, your health of your river is also very high. It's also very good. So if you have declining or, or uh, rate of the dolphins in the river, it means your river is polluted, it's not healthy, and a lot of other species uh, within it are also getting affected. So we've again partnered with WWF Pakistan um, to conserve uh, in disabled dolphins. Uh, so these are the two, three things that we're actively working on. And yeah. Well, that's music, Maya. Thank you for a. Uh, thank you for telling us all uh, about it. And I'm really glad that I know um, you mm -hmm. is doing all of this. Um, there are two points which I want to highlight when you were talking. I was thinking the first is that you know in the past, corporate thought was that CSR is a cost item. It used to be something, something to take out of the profits. And to do a charity work. The sons like us, they tell us that it was like that. But now the new body of work which has come out says that doing good is good, is good for your business. It's actually good for your profits. Because if you are doing all of this, then your employees will be happier, your customers will be happier, your society will be more healthy, and that means that your profits will be more sustainable. And because this body of work has been accepted by global investors. Investors now want to invest in companies who are doing good because those companies have higher and superior long-term returns. So, so I'm really glad that you know you're doing this. And the second thing when you were telling us about uh, the dolphins, it was so important. Now my 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 second daughter, she is eight years old. We live in London, and she's taught so much about dodo, uh, the species, I mean, the bird which is extinct. That you know, she knows she knows more about that than than, than I I do, and she's fascinated by it. So over there in school, at you know at a young age, children are taught about how big a loss uh, uh, the loss of biodiversity is. So while in Pakistan, telling us, I certainly didn't know about it, and I'm sure many people in the society don't know about you know uh, about about it. So so I think it's it's imperative that this information is brought into uh, the, uh, the national narrative at every level. So, and you mentioned about trees, so, you know, moving to, that's a great, great bridge to the next speaker. We'd love to hear from you about why forests are important and what kind of trees um, are important for us. And I must say before that as well, that, you know, again, trees and forests is one area which Historically, people also thought that we should do it just because of green, we're getting green thing, uh, um, um, uh, credentials. That, you know, if World Bank says that, you know, you should plant trees, so let's plant trees. But I think you always argue that it's actually also a big commercial opportunity. Because globally, if I look at like all the, you know, the establishment investors, like, you know, the, the Rothschild or the Goldsmiths, they are big investors in this area. So we'd love to hear from about that one as well. First of all, uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, effect of climate change is actually in soil. The carbons have gone down and it will continue to go down if we look and seem to have the similar statistics of effects of uh, climate change which you have highlighted in the report. 
so uh, Pakistan, uh, the bad news first is that uh, we have only 4% of our land which is covered by forests. And the good news is that there is a huge site which is available to us. And that would be the catalyst for our future development in this area. Uh, and it is a given fact that if you plant trees, the soil carbon will also uh, increase and it will also bring fertility. And that fertility is an imperative for food security. And in the old times, uh, many of uh, the uh, old uh, societies, they always made it a point that uh, they will plant trees uh, for as a fodder to the animal because animals were the main stay for most of the economic activity in those days. So we have lost that, but it's again time to get back there. Uh, in Pakistan, our experience about uh, plantations has been that we just uh, made sure that we put those trees which are probably economically not that very effective, like eucalyptus. If you talk about the uh, billion tree tsunami, 90% of the trees which have been planted in eucalyptus and it has very little economic advantages for uh, the community, except that it can be cut and burned. And if our policymakers have thought it a little bit better, they could have understood it that these trees are not that effective. What is effective? Nature has given us diversity of local uh, flora, and all other local trees are such which are not in the and they are very high quality, worldwide also, and also from the climate point of view. To give you an example, kicker can be grown in every part of Pakistan, in every uh, area, whether it is the deserts of uh, Pakistan or drought stricken areas of uh, Sindh or in Pakistan. Uh, uh, this kicker is something which is of very high quality trees, and we have stopped planting them. And if we are even planting it, we have not improving the technology. The new technologies which have come about, like polyploidy, which can improve the carbon intake of uh, trees by at least doubling, that could improve the size of the tree that instead of 12 years, a tree can grow in seven years. That technology is available globally. We have to think about bringing that technology here. And we have institutes here and uh, scientists here who can actually do it. So working together with those uh, scientists, this is a big area which I have uh, initiated working with them and I see that this kicker can be developed. Today, it is just five rupees a uh, sapling. And if every individual in Pakistan plant one tree a year and make sure that every year they just plant one five rupee tree, what effect it could have in our uh, flora in the next 10 years' time, it can easily be uh, understood. And, and the biggest other advantage is that it's a good replacement of uh, fodder. 40% uh, of our soil today is used for growing fodder. The other 30% is used for our producing food. And the rest is slime land, acidic sand, or uh, our uh, deserts in uh, Thar, Turistan, Thal, and those are not being used properly. So we have this kicker which can also grow in those areas. But more importantly, there are a lot of work done on uh, Saliconia and uh, Sarcoconia. We have an 800 kilometers long seaside. Saliconia has been proven as one of the best fodder replacement, and also it has a very high uh, carbon sequestration, uh, sometimes more than uh, the forest itself. Uh, another product which is, it's taboo to talk about it, but the fact is that hemp cultivation can bring more carbon than uh, forest. To give an example, one hectare of hemp uh, 
can be equal to 25 hectares of forest. And there are such uh, seeds available now where we don't have cannabis. But here we do have still uh, going on uh, uh, tests and uh, certain uh, institutions have been allowed to plant it and test it. But it has become a taboo in this country to talk about uh, hemp. Many countries, especially uh, in uh, some of the Middle East areas, they are trying it, testing it, and uh, they have found it extremely, extremely useful. And there are multiple other uses of uh, hemp also. And that can be a great opportunity economically for uh, uh, people to make money on uh, hemp uh, uh, cultivation. And uh, we can achieve uh, within five years a uh, lot of benefits out of it economically and also from the climate change point of view. Uh, we have uh, this coastal area, we have got this California, uh, which can be a, as I mentioned, a, a replacement for fodder. But also there is another one, which is Sarcopornia, which can be planted in our desert areas using the subsoil saltish water. Uh, especially that, uh, like in uh, Thar, where we have a huge uh, uh, coal uh, mining uh, uh, efforts going on, there is a lot of underground water which is of no use. It's a saltish water. Sarcopurnia can easily be planted around that and it can transform the whole region of Thar because there is a big uh, animal population in, uh, in Thar uh, that can immediately have an impact within three to six months time, we can have uh, our own border in those areas for those animals. And it can transform the economic activity and the society at large in those areas. Thirdly, uh, which is a proven fact that for broad uh, uh, areas, uh, especially in India, they have planted bamboos. And also for saline uh, soils, there are varieties of bamboos which can have excellent results. It is proven that wherever there is a bamboo plantation, the water levels have increased. It has the ability to absorb water uh, from atmosphere as well and put it down into the soil, which is an amazing, amazing uh, 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 plant Allah has given to the world and especially for our country. Bamboo plantations can do a lot of uh, miracles. And also that uh, those are raw resistance, especially two varieties are such. There are 1,400 varieties of bamboo, but the two varieties can work very well and are being planted in Pakistan for a long time, but it has to be expanded. Now, coming to the food security itself, I go back to my first point about soil. If you have a good quality soil, you will always have better crop. What is good quality soil? Good quality soil is where you have more carbon. These trees and these plantations can improve and increase the uh, carbon in the soil. And with that, you can enhance your uh, productivity. One of the major reasons why Pakistan is lacking uh, in terms of our per acre yields is that our soil is not uh, having that much of carbon which is required there. So, uh, a lot of things in that area is uh, required to be done. Of course, the initiative with government of Pakistan is not taking to put up 10,000 megawatt of solar is a good, good initiative. It's a great initiative. But there are many such indigenous uh, things which we can achieve through uh, farming and plantations, which can help us reduce this uh, uh, big calamity which we are facing. Uh, in terms of uh, the uh, heat waves, which we have seen, but we can be assured that much more heat waves are going to come soon. And also the drought, which is another major problem, this can also be improved with these plantations. Uh, we as a, uh, say, uh, Sanjari Agroforestry uh, Group, are working in this direction. We are working with farmers also. We are giving them seeds for plantation. But more importantly, we are targeting to improve the uh, uh, plants through tissue culture. And uh, our main focus is that uh, through tissue culture, forestry products, 
we can actually improve a lot of uh, uh, these uh, results of these plantations, which can become it can become much faster. Also, that with uh, Islamic University of Bhagalpur, we are working now on the uh, Juristan Desert and introducing uh, Salicornia there and uh, uh, Sarcopornia and the Sarcopornia plantations we are expecting to start from February this year and that would be a pilot project initially and then it would be expanded to the most of the regions in the, in the area. We are working very closely with some institutions who are responsible and involved in that area. They are all on board and it is an institutional support and commitment like that of Anglo or Koji Foundation uh, or other institutions like that which would be the main, uh, say, uh, driving force because depending on individuals only that they would bring you and put the forest is not possible. You have to have institutional commitment to make sure that uh, they fully buy into the concept. And this 4% can easily be increased to 20% as the target, say, and because a lot of areas in Rajasthan are still available where these plantations are possible. Desert areas are available where these plantations. And saline soils, which are affected and they cannot be used for other purposes, uh, that can also be converted into uh, forests. Uh, these are some of those uh, thoughts which I think is uh, becoming more and more uh, in talk and uh, available for people to ask questions. The knowledge is there, but it's important how to implement that. Thank you for that. And before we go for more questions, I have a video message from one of the particip participants who couldn't join, but who recorded a video, uh, which I'll just play on the screen. And I'll go for further questions. Bismillah al It's a... Uh... Pleasure to be invited by Kasab to speak on this very important climate change conference. I'm Mustafa Kadir Sayyid, the executive director of the Pakistan China Institute. As we talk about climate change and what's on soon in Pakistan, I think we have to put things into perspective. Firstly, Pakistan is not a victim only, but Pakistan is not a solution. And what has happened to Pakistan is a global phenomenon, which does not have a face, it doesn't know any borders, and it does not have partisanship. And whatever happens in Pakistan will not stay in Pakistan. It is a rude reminder to all of us that the climate change existential issue is at our doorstep. And it has just come via Pakistan, that will go to all other countries in the globe if we do not stop it, and it will affect human civilization. So when we talk about what has happened in Pakistan, when we emit 0.2% emissions, the people who have been at the receiving end of this, who have been dislocated, killed, owned, destroyed, who essentially lost everything, including their lives, did not do anything to contribute to climate change. But the emitters of the world, particularly those developed countries, developed world, the global north, so to speak, needs to address this issue. And here we can talk about climate justice because the People who have nothing to do and have no correlation with climate change have been penalized for climate change that was done by others. So this climate justice is a very important concept that needs to be institutionalized as soon as possible. And the countries which have actually contributed to these mega emissions and those who have industrialized and during the industrialization which they did decades and decades before the global south did emit a lot and are actually still emitting the united states for example 
emits 56% accumulative, uh, accumulative emissions more than Pakistan. And the US alone takes up 20% of the world's emissions. So how do we move forward when there is this gap in the discourse when we are only talking about how to rehabilitate these people and how to take on climate change when the world's leading emitters are continuing to emit. So this is a very important issue. And when we talk about and discuss and have this dialogue, particularly with the upcoming COP, for addressing climate change, factoring climate change in their sustainable development strategies for moving forward, they have to industrialize as well. And how can they industrialize and find that fine line between industrialization and sustainability without emitting the carbon that they have been emitting in the past? So that fine line is a right of the global south because with climate change, which is an existential issue, as I said, we also have very rising, very highly rising poverty. And particularly with the flood, which has 30 million people almost affected, poverty is increasing, compounded with inflation and the after effects, and the byproducts of the Russia Ukraine war. So this intellectual honesty, so to speak, at this time is very important to factor in the discourse of climate change. And those emitters in the West should come up, come forward, and take responsibility and ensure that funds that are owed to the people who have been affected by climate change, particularly in the recent example of Pakistan, are given that compensation that they deserve and are entitled to. And as we move forward, we have to develop a paradigm where the global south can continue to develop and industrialize with lesser emissions. But having the developed world and the developing world on the same footing is unfair because the developed world has already gone through the uh, industrialization, when they have already emitted a lot and have reached this place where now they do not need, need to emit so much, whereas the global south is still in that process. So I think the onus is on the global north, the first world countries, if I may say so, that need to take the onus of responsibility and who need to cede space, reduce their emissions, and give opportunity to industrialize to the global south and decrease their carbon emissions to a level where the global south can continue emitting within certain parameters and industrialize and come at par. We have to have a holistic, comprehensive, inclusive approach to development where there should be some give and take, a collective response and a collective approach in order to forward it's not and pointing fingers is not the solution a lot of countries feel in the global south that some countries are trying to stunt the industrialization and development of countries in the global south and developing countries and that perception is dangerous because it weaponizes climate change and politicizes climate change which is something that needs to remain above the fray I wish this conference a resounding success. It's at a very opportune time, and I hope that we can have more dialogues like these in the future. Thank you very much. I think um, a lot of important things have been discussed um, today. Um, and the key point for me is that uh, this is a very complex issue where the frameworks are not there, the knowledge is not there, the challenges are huge. Global collaboration is required. The impacts are from cross-border. 
and uh, there's a lot of complexity around everything. And as the earlier speaker said, that it's even more complex because countries like Pakistan, because we are suffering from what has been done by other countries in the past. And hence, you know, what was mentioned earlier in terms of South-South collaboration is important. And also accessing some of these sources of capital is important. So I go back to the same four points. I think that you know we need more money, we need more policy or better policy, we need more knowledge. And once we have all of that, then we need collaboration and coordination with a coherent coherence to affect the whole supply chain. So I know a lot of people will have questions, but I'm also conscious of time and the tea waiting outside. So perhaps it might be better that if we do the questions in person on tea. So with that, you know, I want to thank uh, the speaker, Mr. Salman. Um, I uh, um, we got we were waiting, but so uh, I think with that, I would love to thank the, the speakers for coming and for their views. But uh, I would ask you more questions uh, when we are having tea. So thank you. <laughs>